Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Sophie Ward this evening to our At Home with Literati series in support of love and other thought experiments and in conversation with Jean Hanf Corlitz. Uh, just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed this evening, but you can keep that chat window open as I will be sharing links to purchase Love and Other Thought Experiments from our store throughout the event. You can use the Q&A feature on your toolbar to submit questions at any time, and I will read a selection of those questions on your behalf at the conclusion of the conversation tonight. And live transcription is available to you on your toolbar as well if you need closed captioning. Uh, if you're watching us later on YouTube, of course, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below me. You can also subscribe to be kept apprised of our events as they become available on our channel after they air live. And as a final reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. Most of all, we'd just like to thank you for your attendance this evening uh, or this morning or this afternoon, um, depending on when and where in the world you may be joining us. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Sophie Ward is an actor and writer. She's published articles in The Times, The Sunday Times, The Observer, and Red Magazine, and her short stories have been published in the, in the anthologies Finding a Voice, Book of Numbers, Spiral Path, and The Gold Room. Her book, Marriage Proposal, The Importance of Equal Marriage and What It Means for All of Us, was published as a Guardian short ebook in 2014. In 2018, Sophie won the Pindrop Short Story Award for Sunbed. She has a degree in philosophy and literature and a PhD from Goldsmith University of London on the use of narrative and philosophy of mind. Speaking with her this evening, Jean Hanf Korlitz is the New York Times bestselling author of the novels The Plot, You Should Have Known, which aired on HBO in October 2020 as The Undoing, Admission, the Devil and Webster, The White Rose, uh, and a jury of her peers, as well as The Interference Powder, a novel for children. Her company, Book the Writer, hosts pop-up book groups in which small groups of readers discuss new books with their authors. She lives in New York City with her husband, Irish poet, Paul Muldoon. Please join me in welcoming Sophie Ward and Jean Hamp Corlitz uh, and Jean's dog uh, into your living rooms. <laughs> Yes, he's, uh, he's ready for his close up. So um, John mentioned uh, Book the Writer. We did a Book the Writer event uh, about six months ago, mm -hmm. six months ago. And uh, that's when I first read the book, but I'd, I'd been eager to read the book because, uh, you know, I've, uh, John didn't mention this, but you have an entirely other life as an actor. Mm -hmm. You've been a working actor since you were 10 years old. Um, and usually when we hear, oh, you know, an actor's written a novel, um, what we're expecting is not what we got with this book. So I was very, very keen to read the book. Um, and the, as you know, because we've discussed this, the minute I started to read it back in last winter, I went, oh, oh my God. And I immediately called a friend of mine who's a philosopher at Princeton to like hold my hand as I read the book and thank goodness he did. I, I will say that it's not necessary um, to understand everything in this novel. I, I understand, I'm gonna go with about 20% of this novel and yet it was such a pleasure to read and, and we'll get to some of the reasons that um, I love this book so much. And, and also why, you know, once you read it, you're really compelled to talk about it which is why I hope the people watching tonight um, uh, read it not alone. I think they should read it in pairs or in groups because <laughs> they're really going to want to talk about it. Um, but you know, maybe you could say a little something about your long and winding road to literature because it is, it's a very un unusual path that you took. Mm. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I left school uh, when I was 18 because I was already working as an actor. So I sort of, and I, I hadn't had a brilliant uh, education up to, it was pretty sketchy up till then anyway. Um, and then when I was in my thirties, I was drawn to going back. So I did um, a remote degree uh, with the Open University. I don't know if, if you probably have heard of it. Oh well, yeah, so I no. think my husband, got an honorary degree from the Open University. He got okay. an honorary degree from the Open University. Right, 
Right. Well, it's a very august institution and it does really great degrees um, I and mean, you can take them in your own time. And I was doing TV series. I think I was doing a TV series about talking dinosaurs at the time. And um, so uh, anyway, I did I did my first degree like that. And then I went back and did an MA. Um, and by this time, I was really interested in this overlap between philosophy and literature and the way that um, in these tiny little stories, which are known as thought experiments, there was a sort of meeting of science and the humanities, it seemed mm. to me, which are often sort of falsely separated. But I loved how, you know, really um, interesting and brilliant ideas were being thought of by philosophers and scientists and being explained in these sort of fantastical scenarios like, things about zombies or going to other planets or I loved it um, and I and I was also really interested in this um, this idea of uh, you know looking at consciousness and the mind and what was going on in philosophy when I was studying when I studied my PhD was a lot of um, very eminent philosophers sort of dismissing the idea of consciousness and individuality and saying that's it's a falsehood um, it's created by our brains to make us sort of continuous animals, but there was no such thing as the mind or certainly not the soul. Um, and I, I wanted to explore that as far as I could possibly go using those thought experiments, expanding them into a novel. Um, so I, I took all 10, 10 of my favorite exper thought experiments and, and put my characters in. Sorry, I don't know if you can hear that. So. It's okay. Incoming, incoming email. <laughs> and um, and uh, yeah, and then, uh, and then sort of tried to take that, those ideas as far as I could. And they took me in a direction I wasn't expecting at all. Um, and, uh, and actually I found it all strangely reassuring and I hope people reading it, although the, some of the ideas seem so far-fetched, will, yeah. will feel reassured as well. So I have to ask, I mean, you narrowed it down to your 10 favorites. Yeah. How long was the list to begin with? Oh, well, there are so many, because um, they, they, although obviously this is the retrospectroscope because they didn't call them thought experiments then, but you know, ancient Greek philosophers were, were using the ideas of, you know, d does a horse, think about a horse god, you know, so there were sort of those early prototypes and then um, all the way through all the history of philosophy, they've been using thought experiments, but I was really looking at, I did use a few of the older ones. I've got Blaise Pascal's, um, Pascal's wager um, and um, the idea of whether or not you, you, this thing about whether you step into the same waters if you change, if you change, and how we constantly change, and Theseus's ship—that's that's known as. Um, but mostly, it was looking at sort of post 1970s philosophy, and because that's when everything really accelerated, and philosophers started to communicate with each other through these thought experiments, and are replying to each other with a new thought experiment. It was, it's fascinating. I have never thought of philosophers speaking, you know, sort of using narrative, almost using fictions to communicate ideas. I thought they were scribbling numbers on little bits of paper. <laughs> I know, I know. But actually, of course, we're all drawn to story. And, and a lot of the things that they that they're talking about aren't things that you can reproduce very easily, like if you put somebody's brain in somebody else's body, would they be the same person? Um, hopefully nobody's doing those experiments um, at the moment anyway. And so they can only really be looked at it sort of theoretically, mm -hmm. hypothetically. Um, and so what they, but instead of just posing the question, they then sort of create this scenario and they are slightly weighted because obviously with fiction you can, put in whatever elements you like so but they are weighted towards proving something that they want to say so i'm fascinated by this this uh origin story where you you choose your 10 favorite i'm sure we all have 10 favorite thought experiments but choose your 10 favorite thought experiments you, you put them on the floor you start to move them around at what point does a story emerge mm. and does it emerge all at once or 
do you just kind of set off and jump lily pad to lily pad as mm. you got into the novel? Well, there was, there was definitely, that's a, lo a lovely way of putting it. There was quite a lily pad thing about it. I think I, at first I thought it was going to be just a kind of quite a straightforward linear novel. And then at the end of, uh, when I got my first story and, um, and my characters, Rachel and Eliza and the baby they make and the sort of um, event that happens to them, I... I then thought, oh, well, I loved seeing things from different people's points of view. Um, and I thought, well, let's, let's, I've got all these thought experiments. Why don't I have a look at what the son's point of view is of the same kind of uh, um, incident and the, and the, both the moms and they, um, their friends with the two guys who were co-parenting with them. I wanted to find out what they thought. And then um, we have our aunt, that comes into the story. Yeah, so let's talk about the aunt. So um, let's say, you know, you're you're in an elevator with Steven Spielberg and you've got four floors to make your, to tell him why, you know, Love and Other Thought Experiments should be his next movie. You're not, probably not going to lead with the philosophy. You're no. going to say, what are you going to say? I'd love to hear. Okay, this is not my strong point, Jean. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not okay. a great elevator. It's, it's a terrible person. thing to ask, but I'm, I'm going to, I'll do it if you can't do it, but I want to hear yours first. Okay, um, so uh, it's a love story, um, and it's a story of a boy looking for his mother and um, how we can, ex how we can meet each other's minds and, in our story, an ant is also incorporated into somebody's mind and grows, learns to have the consciousness of the mind that the ant enters. Okay, but we're not, this is not a, this is not an animated film. We're not anthrop, well, we are anthropomorphizing this ant. Well, yeah, I mean, or, yes, I mean, there's a meeting of minds that's, uh, you know, they always say that um, artificial intelligence, the limit of artificial intelligence is that we can't give artificial intelligence emotions because it's not embodied and it doesn't have our sensorial experience. So the ant in, in the book is a kind of link between people and uh, the artificial world and it becomes the sort of mixture of the two. So the ant makes an appearance or a potential appearance very early in the novel and his kind of, uh, his initial impact is that he creates a sort of crisis between this couple. Um, this is an ant who may or may not have actually crawled into the eye of one of your protagonists. Um, and her partner says she believes this to be true, but she doesn't really. So um, it becomes a thing in their relationship in the same way that uh, one partner believing in God and the other not would become. Um, it's very much like that. Yeah, it, it's it's a a therapy, basically, and it's something that they never, ever get past. Um, you don't solve this mystery of the, is it in fact true or not, until mm -hmm. we're significantly into this book um did it were you always going there or was it going to be a, an unsolvable problem at one point yeah i know i wasn't always going there um i tried to let um what i discovered as i was writing and developing the stories um uh, guide me uh through and then when i and then i got to the chapter where i was like well this is the chapter with, from the ant's point of view and um that was a really exciting chapter to write and then became very real to me, um, this, this wow. person and, uh, and their experience. Um, I guess it was just another way of looking at how, how powerful our, our minds are, our, our sense of individuality and how the ant has come from a, a system where it's all about the collective um, and sees things very much as a sort of whole and then suddenly gets this insight into a human world where it's about the individual and um, what an extraordinary change of perspective that is. Well, I love that you describe this as exciting because we're at, we're, we're at my novel that it ends suddenly crawls into you and, uh, you know, asks me to write from this perspective. I would have been, you know, running in terror from this 
the oh. problem. And it sounds like you just went straight into it. Did you have no apprehensions at all? <laughs> <laughs> of, course, of course, but probably no more than any, any other writing challenge. Um, it, it's, you know, it's, maybe it's a, I mean, I think all writers are sort of actors as well, aren't they? Because you're sitting there writing and imagining and uh, that's the same job that an actor does when they're thinking about how they're going to bring a character to life or what it is about the, the, their particular character that makes them who they are. Um, that's very much a similar leap of imagination that writers are doing all the time. And I, I know the end result obviously is the actor has to stand up and do it in front of people, but and the writer writes it down, but it's, to me, it's a very, the preparation is very similar. Mm. Well, I'm just wondering how, whether the ant sort of intensified your, uh, the difficulty of maybe finding a publisher or finding an editor. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> all these nightmare scenarios. Like, yes, no, the practicality, <laughs> yes. Um, the practicalities, I know and, uh, and when I watch other, other writers talking I'm always interested in that you know what that how that was and it, it was difficult I was very lucky um, in that uh, a few people read it early on and were enthusiastic about it um, but they were not publishers <laughs> it went to a lot of publishers um, and although they have these night they have a nice way of saying it a lot of people were saying well you know what would what do we do with this book where would it go which shelf which section yeah all of that exactly uh which i completely understand um uh, I, I think i was just really lucky because you know slowly people picked it up and then once it found its home uh, and its publisher they um and, and then it got it started to get some nice reviews and you know I was just really impressed about how people will embrace I don't think it's difficult uh, I tried to make it into an interesting story and uh, you know uh, uh, the character I, I, I didn't try to make it dif a difficult read but obviously yeah. it's unusual it's uh, a challenging read but it's it is so beguiling I mean this novel has in addition to all of this kind of intellectual chewiness, don't you love that word? Um, I do. It has a real sweetness too. I mean, it's there's a there's a very human side to this novel about humanity or humanness. Um, Thank you. And if you if you if you took away all of this uh, exoskeleton of these ideas that you want to explore, you'd still have a very lovely moving compelling book you know filled with you know wonderful characters but what you did was so ambitious mm -hmm. i mean it's really it's it's i don't know i don't i don't i've never come across a debut novel like this and i i may never again mm -hmm. uh maybe it took a writer who had had a whole other life and career who came late to education and philosophy in particular and fiction to make this book. I mean, I, I don't know who else could have produced it. I and mean, when I talk to people about this book and you know, it's not the only thing I talk about. <laughs> it may seem like it's the only thing I talk about, but I, I just tell them, just keep going with this mm -hmm. book because you will, you will get it. And remember at the top of this discussion, I, I mean, I outed myself as somebody who does not understand everything in this so i'm i'm coasting along on the 20 30 percent that i am the master of and that's enough i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't say no to understanding more but i'm i'm satisfied i got a lot out of it thank you so much i, I i'm really honored that that well you know i mean as a writer you're always pleased when people are, are, are reading your work but it's when when uh it's it's a little bit more unusual for most people than to to for them to um go with it i'm i'm yeah. really thrilled about that yeah but but jean when i mean I, i'm reading one of your books at the moment I, and i've read another one uh, I, i've seen your adaptations and uh, i mean you it's the same thing you know you're you 
the, the detail when you're writing, I'm not reading the plot at the moment, and the, the detail of people's inner lives is extensive that you're portraying there. You know, you, there's no emotion unturned. You get, you're, you're going through everything. So it's to me, it's the same thing, really, isn't it? You just, because you really- I love it because it. when I was looking at the novel again today, I realized that although, uh, although I might've said, there's very little overlap between your novel and any of my work. In fact, there is, there's a very interesting overlap in, uh, in my novel, Admission. I have it out here because I was reading it, which is about an admissions officer at Princeton I wanted to, I wanted an idea of what a brilliant young philosopher might say in his uh, admissions essay to Princeton. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't even attempt to do this myself. I happen to have, as you know, I happen to have a friend who's a Princeton philosopher and I, and I called him, I shouldn't be admitting that there's any part of my novel that I didn't write myself, but I said, I want two little paragraphs. I want one by a jerk, like a, a narcissistic, pompous ass, um, 17 year old narcissist who thinks he knows everything. And I want a paragraph by a brilliant young philosopher to be who would be instantly recognizable to philosophers. And what I got back from my friend was, you know, a, a, exactly the kind of, you know, pompous paragraph that I might have imagined, but I also got a paragraph about zombies. And I thought, what is what does zombies have to do with philosophy? So I got an earful about yes. zombies and sure enough, you know, so we've both written about the thought experiment, yeah. about zombies, yeah. except I didn't really do it myself. I just, <laughs> I just made a few changes and stuck it in the book. But then when I, I came across the zombie thought experiment in your book and I was like, oh, zombies, yes, I know all about Yes, them. I know all about zombies. I know all about the zombies, but really <laughs> who thinks these things up? Okay, we've got the prisoner's dilemma. Yeah. We've got, the cat is the cat in your book schrodinger's cat Schrodinger. no but that is that yeah that is exactly the sort of thing yes that's a scientific it didn't make the top 10 maybe top 20 what yeah probably in there in the top 20 yeah so but <laughs> could you maybe explain to me what it was that attracted you to our common zombie problem oh well so there's a few things about zombies they call them pea zombies in philosophy um, and one of the things about it is that if you can imagine it, if you can think that it might be possible, then probably it is possible. So this idea of a zombie that's just like you, and there's a couple of different thought experiments, but, but, but this is the sort of gist of it. Um, something who's just like you, um, and, but, doesn't, but isn't you, that doesn't have your personality, but they know what you know, they can live your life, they can go and look after, feed Sherlock in the background there and make sure that the lights are out before you go to bed and sort of motor around in your way. But most people who know Jean would look at zombie Jean and go, uh, Jean, you know, are you there? And you'd go and you'd say, yes, I'm fine, but you're not Jean. And we can imagine that. So that's an I. That's just a. It's a very basic way of putting it, but it's a way of thinking that there is something that makes us us. We know that instinctively, and um, like Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, would say that's that's false. That's a false idea, um, but it rings true to us. I think we can we can feel that there's something else that makes us us. That's not just our corporeality, just not just uh, our electric meat, as they say. Um, it doesn't have to be a religious thing necessarily, for some people it is, but there's just this idea of identity and something that's, that's you. So I find that very appealing about zombies. Also, there is such a thing as a zombie ant in a, a South American country where um, the ant gets uh, invaded by a parasite it takes over the ant and it makes the ant 
climb up this plant and then it crawls, it explodes out of its head um, and scatters so that other ants will then ingest it and become zombies and go and do what this thing want to perpetuate the life cycle. So I thought it, that ties in quite well. Did you know about the zombie ant before you knew about this? The zombie ant is real. It's the zombie ant is real, yes. It is real. Yeah. All right. Yeah. When you were writing this chapter from the perspective of the ant, and, and one thing that we haven't talked about is that when, when this ant does in fact enter the body of one of your protagonists, he enters through her eye while she's asleep. Um, he finds something in her brain, uh, which uh, shouldn't be there, well, depending on how you think about uh, mm. illness and disease. He mm. finds a, uh, a tumor Mm -hmm. And she, the, the, the character has some confusion about whether the ant is the tumor, the ant has caused the tumor. She's fixating on an ant because she's afraid to engage with the reality that she has this tumor. But by the time we get to this chapter, which again, I'm, I'm not going to go on and on about this chapter, but I, I reread it today and it's, it's, it's really some of the best writing I've come across in ages. It's a brilliant, brilliant chapter. Um, what emerges from this encounter between the ant and the tumor is a, a kind of, uh, it's not a symbiotic relationship, but it's the ant is, manages the tumor. I mean, the yeah. ant prolongs the life of this woman quite, yeah. quite deliberately. Um, yeah. Can't do it. Uh, indefinitely, but it it does, and um, yeah. I mean, I, I'd love to hear how you know. Again, was that something that you saw coming, or was that something you sort of figured out as you got into it? Um, no, it was it wasn't something I saw coming. I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen, but then once the ant was in there, and um, ants are all female. All the ants that we see are are female. Um, so I've got this female ant and then there's a sort of life presence um, in Rachel because she is pregnant um, and so there's these different things going on in her body there's life and death very much uh, developing together and and then this ant and so I yeah the ant got to work and I I, I am really interested in these you're right, it's not a symbiotic relationship exactly, but it kind of is for that little moment. Um, and then I was thinking about the parasite and the zombie and the just all these things coming together. So yes, I just sort of ran with it. Um, you mentioned the problem, the kind of real world publishing problem of what, what you know, what do we do with this book? Um, and, and of course, when uh, the, the Booker Prize cited this book on its long list. They described it as genre bending. Um, did you, you know, did you pick a genre at the outset, or did you? Was it important to you to know which shelf this book was going? Uh, no, I tried really to put that to the back of my mind because I thought I'm only I want to write the book I want to write, and um, uh, I, I I should just do that because I, I, I'm not an experienced writer. I, I don't have a, a you know a publishing record to keep up or anything like that. I, I, I longed for it to be published and for, to share it with people, but I just thought I better just try and be tr as true to these ideas as I could be. Um, so I kind of took, each chapter's a little bit genre different and I kind of took it, the lead from the thought experiment. Like some of them are quite gothic um, some of them are uh, speculative fiction, sci-fi type things. Some of them are sort of romantic, almost. Um, and so I, I, I took my lead from, from the tone of the thought experiment. Mm -hmm. The original cover, the British cover, had an, an ant. I thought it was quite a literal cover, actually. But I, I really love your American cover. It's very oh. beautiful and... Yeah. Um, even yeah. backwards, it's very beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> it's Were you great. involved in the uh, in the design and? No, I mean you know they they have somebody brilliant in there. I'm not a very um, visual person. That's just what I say when people yeah. ask me that question. I say I'm not visual. No, I I I 
I, I, I don't see things like that. So and uh, my son is a graphic designer and, you know, he, he can come up with all these things. I, it's not my forte. So I, I love it when they bring something to you and then you see it and you're like, yes, that's great. So what do you think they're trying to communicate with, with this? So it's the dismantled head and it's the, so there's a childhood thing and there's the, the, but also the mobile making up of the figure of a man. Yeah. Are you sure you're not visual? I don't see any of that. Really? You can't see the head? Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah there's the chin and the nose there. And, yeah. And the brain. Yeah. Okay. Is it a, is it a colder? Is it an Alexander Calder, or am I imagining that? Or maybe it's the only it's the <laughs> only mobile person. I it was designed by by Linda Huang. So, oh, she did a lovely job. I think did it. I love the colors too. Um, did you want to read a little bit from the book? Oh, I'm very happy to. Yes. Um, if you read something from the zombie chapter, I um, can read my zombie <laughs> admissions essay. As a response, but you don't have to. Well, what for, from the amazing chapter? Okay, this is from the ant. This is our, this is our ant. Um, and up till now, we've had the the, the lives of the of the family um, and and how the ant has disrupted the family. There are two parts to my life, and they are as different from each other as you are to a stranger who sat next to you on a bus one summer's day or borrowed a library book you had once read. The before and after of me are not two halves of one, as many lives must be, young and old, child and parent. There is nothing that follows as a natural progression, only a clear division. Of course, were you to meet me in person, you would not notice anything of distinction about me at all, save perhaps a minor imperfection. Introducing myself to you this way, though, through a meeting of minds, as it were, will allow you to understand the very great change in my circumstances. We say meeting of minds, though really it is my mind that is being met. This is not a two-way discovery. Welcome. The difficulties you may experience in understanding my story are to be expected. There is a small comparison to be made between my own transformation and the one you are embarking upon, but only a small one, since your discovery is by conventional means and mine was, as far as can be told, unique. Yet you will be prey to sudden jolts and shocks and your already advanced and settled knowledge of the world and its physical constraints will at times obstruct the absorption of new conflicting information. Still, here we are, embracing the process. We must commend ourselves for our exploratory natures. We will start with the night that everything changed. The first difficulty is how to properly convey the way things happened without tainting your impressions with my current form. You will understand so much more if we can edge a little into my original incarnation and proceed from there. To this end, let us envisage the bedroom of the converted Victorian terrace flat on a warm June night. The household sleeps and our small party enters from the garden, lured by the scent of something sweet. So a very erudite ant, not, not the sort of ant. He ends up very erudite. <laughs> well, he's, he, he, he's, He's supping on brain food, so that yes. sort of makes sense. Yes. So the something sweet, yes, as I infer, is actually the smell of this tumor, this yes. undiagnosed tumor. Quite um, right, yes. In itself, a kind of startling insight to think of disease as having a smell, um, mm -hmm. a pre-diagnosed disease as... Well, is that, there is, I mean, they, they're, they're developing so many ways that I think dogs in particular can, will be able to, I think they're very good at um, smelling coronavirus actually, but, but they're very, um, they're training them for different kinds of cancers as well in humans. They, they have such a developed sense of smell. That's, that's amazing. I mean, you must find that your interests sort of lead you down all sorts of alleys and, 
Yes, well, you know what it's like. I mean, that's the fun thing, isn't it, about doing research and and also it's a bit like when you discover the meaning of a word that you should have known years ago, but suddenly you discover it and then it's everywhere. You know, you keep hearing it and you think, how did I not know what that meant before? Yeah, yeah. No. you got to pronounce it, but not what it meant. <laughs> well, my husband, who's also a, a writer, has this theory that when you're writing the right thing, when you're working on the right thing, the world conspires to give you what you need. So you can be in the middle of, you know, your novel and you open up the New York Times and boom, there's the answer to some question. Yeah, absolutely. I don't but believe that, in anything, oh. but I have noticed that that is the case. Yes. Well, it's because your antenna are more alive, aren't they, to that thing, so you pick it up, yeah. I guess so. But and I suppose it's the same thing that you were talking about, you know, a, a word. When you hear a word that you've never heard before and you think, wow, that's a cool word. And then you start hearing it all the time. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to ask you about, um, you know, your, the, the conversation between your literary life, your writing life and your acting life. Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, you know, one obvious contrast is that you're, as an actor, you're speaking somebody else's words uh, as opposed to your own. Another contrast is that acting is so collaborative and you're, you're never alone. There's always um, a lot of people there, everybody with an opinion. <laughs> um, how would you say, or if, it's, if this is even the case, um, that your life as an actor uh, and all the different projects that you've done, I mean, what did that bring to you as a new novelist? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, was there something in your arsenal that came from your other life? Um, I guess, I mean, I've spent my whole life working on stories, um, living in somewhat sort of imaginary worlds a lot of the time. My, my grasp of reality is probably quite tenuous. <laughs> um, and also the training that I had was all about improvisation when I was a child. So everything, every acting exercise was about uh, we weren't ever scripted. It was always about, um, you know, take take this box and imagine it's your parent and have a conversation. It was that sort of thing. So um, that that uh, that was a sort of development of one's own. You know, you were devising a piece yourself from then. And um, although I haven't worked on that many devised pieces in the theatre, there's there's always a sense of um, uh, of developing it with the writer if the writer's alive um and if the writer is not alive of trying to interpret the words the best way that you can um i i did really enjoy the autonomy of being able to sit down and write whereas obviously as an actor you have to wait to be asked which is terribly frustrating most of the time <laughs> because you know you see um, things that you want to do and you're not asked to do them or you've got an idea for something and you just have to wait. Um, it's, it's the hardest, hardest thing about being an actor is to let yourself be passive in that way. So um, I, and also even when you are working to just do your job and not to be trying to solve everybody else's job. <laughs> <laughs> so you just have to sort of focus, focus, focus. But whereas in a book, you're sort of totally in control of your world. Also, the thing I love doing is being able to go back and fix stuff. Oh, yes. Yes. You and can't do that on stage. You can't. No. You, know, you can do it on film. You, Are you well, allowed to say, can I do another take? Yeah, but only then. I mean, just like maybe once you can ask that, you know, and uh, so you can go away from the set that day and you know how expensive it is to put anything down on film. It, that's like, that's it. So you can spend the rest of your life thinking, why didn't I do that? Um, and you've only had like, you know, the because because of what happens on set, you probably only had about half an hour to think about what you were doing when you were there. And then that moment's gone and it's, that's, that can drive you insane if you think about it too much. Are you more attuned to good writing and bad writing since you started to try to <laughs> be a writer? Um, well, I've always been a reader. I love uh, uh, I love reading, and I I've had I've got uh, you know things that I prefer to read. Um, I'm not sure. I don't. I try not. To, I I love people. 
I love experiments generally, like whether it's a film or a play or a book. If somebody's tried to do something interesting, I mean, we call them noble failures sometimes, and I think that's great. Um, I just love people being creative and making something. And I try not to judge it really about whether it's good or bad, but I guess whether I- Have you been in any noble failures? Am I what? Have you been in any noble failures? (laughs) I've been in plenty of failures. Some of them were noble. I've, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a working actor, so, you know, I've, I, I mostly do the things that I'm asked to do, and uh, some of them, some of them work, some of them don't work, but I'm always, when I'm ever I'm watching something or reading something, I think about the amount of work that's gone into making that. I, I watched something the other day, and I was just like, it, I didn't think it worked, but I just was overwhelmed by how much work had gone into it, and um uh, you know, I so I respect that, of the, but but also just, you know, how brave people are. <laughs> you may be more uh, warm-hearted, big-hearted about this than I am. When I watch these uh, these big budget films, the Marvel films, and 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 you know what's missing? Oh, I know the plot. There's no <laughs> plot. <laughs> Everybody is behaving in in ways that make absolutely no sense and nobody cares. I mean, it's just, uh, it's very frustrating to me. Uh, and I don't have your, uh, your background. Well, no, I can understand that, but I suppose you, you, they're fulfilling a certain function, aren't they? Um, you know, they, they might be what we might call empty calories, but they can still be very enjoyable. I, I can't enjoy it if I don't, if it doesn't make sense, it has to make yeah. sense. Yeah. I, mean, I like the popcorn, Sometimes. I like going to the theater like anybody else, but it just, it's so irritating. Um, mm-hmm. um, I, just as in the theater, I, I, not like you, but I've had a small theatrical element to my life. Um, you know, we have this this little saying in our family, it's always the book, it's always the book. You know, when you walk out of the, a show and you just, you can't quite put your finger on why it was so bad. I mean, the actors were great, the music was okay. Mm-hmm. There was a helicopter on stage, you know. It's the book, stupid, you know, it's just. Yeah, so- yeah. well, I mean, that's certainly true as an actor, you know, uh, so your job is so much easier when the, when the words are good. <laughs> So I won't uh, I won't insult you by asking either of the uh, the questions that we all loathe. Uh, we can all say them together. Where do you get your ideas? <laughs> what is your process? How how many times have you been asked that in your in your brief uh, life as a novelist? How many? Times? I have hardly had any time to have been asked those questions. As an actor, I'm always asked if I prefer film or television, and how do I learn my lines? Those are the those are my main questions. Um, I, know I want to know the answers to those, but I, won't. <laughs> but, um, but I am curious. Uh, I mean, we've talked a little about where the ideas, the many ideas in this novel came from, but uh, I, I, I don't like the word process, but I would like to know what, you know, what is a writing day like for you? And are they all the same or, you know, are they all different? Um, I'm very much a starer into space. I love to write outdoors if it's possible. Um, and uh, that's not very often in the UK can you do that because it's very cold. Um, but if I'm lucky enough to be somewhere warm, that's my favorite thing, just to, to be outside, I, just to look at some leaves and let my brain... I'm a very slow writer, as you may have gathered from that sentence. <laughs> I know when I look, see people who really write thousands of words a day, I'm totally overwhelmed. Um, That is not, I'm, if a few hundred words a day, I'd be really pleased. And probably I scrap those the next day. Oh, so you you go back the next day and you'll chuck out what you did the day before? Um, Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I try to to have some forward momentum, um, but um, if I'm not happy with it, then it has to go, yeah. And at what point do you show what you're working on to? Okay. Um, uh, well, I mean, I'm this is I'm so inexperienced, you know. So I've only I'm writing my third book now, um, and I, I I'd probably be a few drafts in before I'd show it to anybody. 
What about you, Jean? Oh, uh, well, I, I have had the same reader since college. It's a, a classmate of mine who also is a fiction writer, and she has read everything. I mean, there are huge genres that I don't go near. It's ironic that um, that the undoing was turned into a whodunit because I loathe whodunits. I don't care who did it. I never cared who did it. Um, but she's read all that in addition to all the literary stuff. And uh, she's just an extraordinary reader. And the best thing about any reader, I mean, we, we want the people to tell us when we're being indulgent or when things don't make sense, obviously. But if you can also find somebody who when they tell you this is good, you believe them, you know, because we're such we're such self flagellating, you know, basket cases that, um, you know, even when even my editor tells me something's good, I start thinking of reasons why she would say that that have nothing to do with the book being good. Yeah. It's pathetic, really. Yeah. Um, but if you can find that person who says, this is good, this is working that you think, oh, it's good, it's working. I mean, that is just such a fantastic thing. Yes. So um, I'm lucky that I have that person. Mm -hmm. I also uh, trust my agent and I do trust my editor. I trust her so much that when she turns down my work, which she does, um, I know it's not personal. I know it's, she needs it to be better before mm -hmm. I move forward with it. Right. And, uh, that's exactly what happened uh, just before I, wrote the plot, I was, I was in the process of having my book turned down by my editor. And, um, but luckily, as we were saying earlier, um, I've gone back and, and finished that book. So it, it is finally coming out. I want to hear about The Schoolhouse. Tell us about The Schoolhouse. Um, the Schoolhouse is my next book. Um, it's very different from, from Love. It's, um, set in the 70s and the 90s it's um you have a, a child's diary at school in the 70s and then what happens to her uh at this experimental school in the in the um in the 70s and then what happens to her in the 90s when the past kind of catches up with her is there philosophy uh not like in love and other thought experiments no but uh, no no, no, nothing like that. Um, it, but there is uh, ideas of, I mean, I, things that I'm interested in about thought and consciousness, but it's more through um, the development of the characters. Do, as you're writing this one, it sounds a little more kind of film eligible, like adaptable. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're thinking about? Uh, it's not something that I write uh with that in mind no do you do you think about that when you're writing no, although no. ironically i'm 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 going to get to be uh, on the writing staff of the adaptation of the plot and i'm very excited and scared wow that's yeah. amazing jean oh i'm so excited to hear that I, yeah i mean it, it's something i've always wanted to do and who would who would hire me except if i happen to have written the novel so i'm, <laughs> I'm taking advantage of this unique opportunity and you know also i mean you're a little bit younger than me but not that much younger than me i think yeah, um, i'm older than you jean you are yeah i think so i was born in 61. okay i'm a little bit younger than you but i'm a grandmother <gasps> i'm not a grandmother <laughs> <laughs> but don't you feel like at, at our stage of life, the great thing is to learn something new. I feel okay. like I just want to keep learning things. I know, and that's, the, I mean, that's research for books. We get to, we get to do, we get to use that as an excuse. I always used to say when I was acting, if you, if you got classes in something, like you had to play the flute for something or, mm -hmm. you know, do a dance or something. I was like, this is free education. It's amazing. That's nice. Oh, look who's here. We're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> what do you have for us? Up, oh, you're muted. Never thought I'd say that to the moderator. <laughs> still, still can make these mistakes. Okay. Hundreds of events in. Um, we don't have any questions from the audience so far. Uh, folks who are watching can feel free to submit questions using the Q and A feature. I have a couple questions though. With the remaining time that we have, one is a uh, classic bookseller question, which I'll save. But um, and apologies if I'm retreading territory that you've already discussed perhaps but and i touched on this in in some part um but sophie i'm struck by uh 
a, a novel that incorporates philosophy in a way that is direct to the reader. Um, and I'm wondering about some of the sort of literary uh, predecessors to that. Um, I think of novels that sort of hide the philosophy or sort of don't announce the philosophy so much like, um, like the work of George Eliot, say, like her, her novel, Silas Marner, which is very sort of like epistemological novel, um, Middle of March as well, touches on a lot of philosophical subjects to novels that I read in college and really enjoyed, like J.M. Cutsey's The Lives of Animals, which is sort of directly like a sort of uh, like a dialogue from Plato or something like that, where, where it's just his characters from his novels discussing specifically like animal ethics in a very direct way. And I'm wondering, in writing this novel, obviously it's constricted in a way to sort of address these thought experiments sort of on the nose, but in incorporating philosophy and fiction, I'm wondering if you thought about that or have anything to say as a reader as well about these sort of two directions. There's, there's novels that sort of tuck the philosophy into the actual craft of, or sort of like it's hidden in the architecture. And then there are books that, that are sort of like Cutsy or, or other novels that are very straightforwardly like the architecture of, of philosophical thinking is how I'm approaching the fictional work. Um, so obviously your, your novel is directly this, this one thing, but I'm just wondering your thoughts about that through line in, in, in literature of, of different approaches to, to, to philosophical thought within the fictive form. Well, I, I thought um, originally that I might have to be a campus novel that I might have to have that conversation between a little like you were saying earlier Jean about and have the conversation between a sort of a lecturer and and a uh, and maybe a humanities professor or something like that and that they would be able, they would have that discussion but um I, I realized quite quickly I didn't have to do that I didn't put in the thought experiments at the beginning till the very end and then I thought actually if I was reading this I would quite like to have that framework I'd be interested in it and if I'm not interested in it like when you read a quotation at the beginning of a chapter or a book or somebody else's book if you're interested in it you you read it but otherwise you kind of just skip over the stuff that you're not so I think anybody picking up this book could just ignore that page about the thought experiments and then the book will carry on. Um, you don't need to be that. It's only a frame if you're if it's something you're interested in. I like puzzles and things like that. So I thought if I was reading it, I'd want to know. Um, and I I love uh, the work of Bourges. I'm not putting myself in his um, sphere, obviously, um, but I love reading his quite um, sort of sometimes quite literal interpretations of different philosophical ideas. Um, they're quite dry, some of them, but I, I loved I, I love reading them, and I sort of wanted to um, how can I, how can I put it? Just bring some more of that to a to a uh, more of a story, really. Thank you. And then I just have a question for both of you. This is sort of the standard bookseller question. So, uh, excuse me, but we are always looking to source recommendations from wherever we can beyond our bookseller. So I'm curious to know. Um, in addition to each other's books, I know Sophie's reading the plot, um, what you're currently uh, reading and enjoying. Uh, well, I read very quickly. So, it, you know, it's like uh, musical chairs. It's, it's where I sit down when the music stops. That's uh, what I'm reading right now. I'm reading, uh, I'm, I'm doing a Book the Writer event tomorrow night with uh, uh, an Indian American author named Maya Shanvag Lang and her memoir is called What We Carry and it's beautiful. Um, and I'm listening to a memoir called, I chose it for the title, Good Morning Destroyer of Men's Souls, which I've just learned from the book is something that uh, Carrie Nation, who was the woman who brought us uh, prohibition used to say to bartenders, she would go up to bartenders and say, good morning destroyer of men's souls. So I'm, I'm, I'm listening to that, reading that. And then I'll just mention this because there's a teeny tiny chance that you, Sophie, have actually heard of this author. Um, when I was a kid, I was a very horsey kid and I loved all the horse books. There was an English writer named Ruby Ferguson 
who wrote these uh, pony books. There were about eight of them. They were called the Jill Pony Books, and I loved them. And I knew that she had written uh, adult novels as well. This would have been in the 50s, 40s, 50s. And I happened to come upon one at the Chelsea Flea Market uh, last weekend, and I bought it, and I'm reading that too. And it's about an English butler, which frankly is very interesting because until the remains of the day, I had never come across a novel about an English butler. So mm -hmm. there you have it. Ruby Ferguson, oh. Maya Sean Vaglang, and uh, Destroyer of Men's Souls. Yeah. Writer escapes me. Okay, your turn. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I like a, a lot of people who have just finished reading um, Sally Rooney's Beautiful World, Where Are You? Um, and uh, if you love Sally Rooney's books, you will love this one. It's um, beautifully observed and um, very moving. Um, and uh, in fact, my, anybody who's that age, though, it, it's it's quite lethal. I think if you're if you're late twenties, early thirties, my son read Normal People and then um, had to have it taken out of the house because he was like, it's too close to home. I can't take it. Um, and I just finished reading the George Saunders um, A Swim in the Pool in the Rain. Um, which is a, takes um, these Russian short stories by the great Russian writers and analyzes them um, as he would do when he was teaching, which um, uh, was very, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've reached the top of the hour. You've, you can, of course, buy Sophie Ward's Love and Other Thought Experiments and Gene Hamp Corlett's The Plot from Literati Bookstore. If you're watching on YouTube, there's links in the chat. You can also purchase the other books they've mentioned and recommended this evening. Uh, Sophie and Jean, thank you so much for joining us at Home with Literati this evening. We hope to have you in the store soon, uh, but until then, we hope we continue to stay safe and be well. And to all of our viewers, thank you for joining us as well. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Have a great evening, all. Take care. Wake up and say goodbye. <laughs> Bye, Stella. Bye, Bye. all. <laughs>